the impossible dream. Dream big dreams, dream amazing dreams and fantastic dreams. But what if your dream hits a hurdle? Quite literally. What do you do then? How do you respond? How do you pick yourself up and make it to the finish line? Well, listen, we're gonna tell you that story today. What's happening? Robert Kennedy the third here, RK3, that's me, and welcome to another episode of the What's My Story podcast. As we do every week, we have amazing guests, and today is no exception. But before we get to the guests, I just want to thank our sponsor, Kayla O'Brien Media. Listen, if you are into pictures, if you're into video, and you want to make sure that your stuff is on point, make sure that you get connected with Kayla O'Brien Media, whether that's a speaker reel, a demo video, or just content that you want to create and make sure that it looks like a professional did it then get connected with Kayla O'Brien Media and visit her at KaylaO'BrienMedia.com we'll hear a little bit more from her later in the episode we also want to remember that you can not only have the video version of this but you can have the audio version of the podcast by going to what's my story podcast dot live what's my story podcast dot live you'll hear the audio version of this because I know that you want to listen to this great Great stuff in your car, on your way to work, on your way to the party, or on the way to uh, a, a game or something. I don't know. You're going to the stadium. Where it, wherever it is that you're going, you can listen to the What's My Story podcast at What's My Story podcast dot live. Make sure that you share this with everybody because we do this every Monday at 1:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, sharing stories of persistence perseverance and plain old grit to inspire you to keep moving to share your story so that you can transform the lives of others i also if you're looking over on my what side is this my left side I don't, maybe you're right i don't know i i, I fail directional something in in elementary i don't know <laughs> all right go ahead and text me anything that you want to share with me we want you to join the community if you want to get updated if you want to get content if you want to just be a part of our giveaways make sure that you text me 410-936-4049 if you want to suggest guests if you want to uh, have questions answered on the show text me 410-936-4049 if you want to be a supporter of the show, you can also go here on the left, rk3tv.live forward slash BMAC. That's rk3tv.live forward slash BMAC. All right. So listen, we have a fabulous, fantabulous, fantastic guest. My guest today is John Register. John is a four-time All-American graduate of the University of Arkansas, a two-time Paralympian, Paralympics Games, Paralympic Games silver me me medalist. I wish I could get that word right. Silver medalist, all right? Persian Gulf War veteran, TEDx motivational speaker. He has he just recently launched a book called 10 Stories to Impact Any Leader: Journaling Your Way to Leadership Success. After a hurdling accident cut short his Olympic goals, he still found success and made his story happen another way. John, what's your story? Welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going, John okay. Register? RK3 in the house. Oh, my gosh. I can't wait for this conversation. I was like, you're like one of my idols, man. You just are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait, Robert, man. It's so, so yeah. good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so so good to see you, man. I'm, um, are you going to be an influence this year? I know we're kind of in the speaker community here, the National Speakers Association. Will you be there? I, I will be at Influence this year, yeah. and uh, it's going to be in Las Vegas. So we're going to hit a Vegas, yeah. the Strip, and everything. And it's yeah. going to be great to see people back, you know, in person and, and and live, and give folks, you know, hugs or maybe not, or say, "Hey, wait a minute, stay away from me." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. There we go. There we. Go. I think I think we're going to have stickers, or we're going to have uh, uh, something, something to 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 
let people know whether we want to be hugged or, or touched. Or <laughs> right. Just wave wave at me from from across the room. From a, hey, dis- hey, from a distance. Yeah. <laughs> from a distance. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. Good deal, man. So let's let's chat a little bit. I, I just talked a little bit about your history as a Paralympic athlete. Your and and even before that, you were you had you were an athlete anyway, and you had ideas about going to the Olympics. So, but before we get to that part of your story, you were an all American. Tell us a little bit about what your, your ideas or what your dreams or what your goals were like growing up as an athlete. What, what did you want, want to want to become? Well, I really don't know what I wanted to become when I was in high school. I mean, you do things yeah. in high school and you, you know, you're pretty good at something. I was a state champion in the 300 meter hurdles. Uh, but, Honestly, you know, when I when I got to the University of Arkansas, that's when things shifted yeah. because I actually saw in front of me uh, on the team people that had just come back from the Olympic Games. So I got you know on the team that recruited me in Michael Conley, you know, arguably one of the best doublers in the long jump uh, and uh, long jump triple jump in the world. So he's, you know, jumped over 28 feet in the long jump. He's jumped, you know, almost close to 60 feet in the triple jump. So yeah. these were the people on the team that I saw all the time. And when you, I came and I won a conference championship, I began to really believe that I could be like them. I could actually yeah. make an Olympic team. So that's my, my mindset began to, to be that, right? My, my yeah. set was seeing everybody, and then I can do that because I'm on the team with them. And I yeah. think that's what's really important for uh, your listeners that are out there, for all of us that are are elevating in our lives to surround ourselves with people who are doing it so that we yeah. can believe that we can do it too. Wow. So I want to point out something before we even go further in this interview. We I think we did a wide shot just now of you. Let's actually go back to that. And behind you, there's this, instrument this this cello and I, I so i'm assuming that you either play the cello or you just like to have it as a background and then you've got the art in the background tell tell us a little bit about what's going on back there man so there's there's a lot that's happening back here and i really believe this is what helps drive me so yes yeah. i am a recovering cellist so i play cello and orchestra <laughs> Uh, so uh, I scratch on it now, you know, so I could do that. Uh, but then I have this, you know, if you look, I got the the painting that's there, and that's the funeral yeah. procession that that many people saw on the Cosby Show. So I, I love art, and also if I kind of move my head around, there's another one you can't really see it, but that's a, a gentleman playing a, playing the horn, um, so the, the 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 trumpet. And then oh, behind the cello is when we won the pin relays. That's one of the pictures when uh, we won the 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 distance medley relay. And in the other picture, that's kind of over uh, over here. That's when we won the four by four at the pin relays, Franklin Field, Pennsylvania. Uh, so I got two of those discs right right. Um, right here that we took home the championship. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So are you an art collector? Do you just like, I mean, I, you said it was from the Cosby show. Did you buy it from the Cosby show auction? I mean, how did, what, what's your interest there? No, I saw it. Uh, both my wife and I were watching the show. We liked the print. And uh, yeah. so we went to go try to find it and we, we found the print and we have, we do, uh, you know, I, it's not that I, I like just art. It's, it's kind of, there has to be like a personal connection with it for me. So I, I bought an, another piece for my daughter was off of a, a young, a 19 year old young lady uh, that had a, a really cool thing with this uh, kind of African-American uh, diaspora print with mm-hmm. flowers coming out of her hair. It kind of was a significance of, you know, this kind of this whole uh, I I am of, of beauty. Right. So it was this beauty picture and so i I wanted that for my daughter for her going into her first uh, apartment and so we picked up that print as as well and we'll frame it and you know put it up there so it's not necessarily that i'm you know looking at van gogh or picasso or those type of things it's just things that speak to me personally uh that that impact my life so that's you know that's 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 why i collect it yeah i'm asking you these questions man because a lot of times people come on a show or people see us and we introduced you we said you know john's a paralympic athlete he's he's this and we started to talk about your athletic uh career and sometimes people see us as this one-dimensional character right and i just wanted to ask you about some of the other things that you were interested in some of the other things that bring you to life so that people also see hey 
You know, that the, the, these people have these interests, they have stories, they have just a breadth of things that that drive them, that make them passionate and that doesn't minimize their expertise in in any specific area so let's 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 jump back into the main part of this story though so you you're you're coming out of college and you go into the military and you end up being persian gulf tell us a little bit about that experience i wanted to continue to run track and field yeah and i had i graduated with a degree in communications radio television programming and production and I had a job offer down in Mississippi, but I wanted to continue to run track because I just finished up the Olympic trials, my first Olympic trials. And I said, yeah, you know, I just don't know if I want to jump into the workforce right now. I need to get this out of my system. Mm -hmm. The Army had a world class athlete program, which allows a soldier wow. athlete to train three or four years prior to the next Olympic Games. And I said, you know, if I make the Olympic trials, I probably can make this team, this program. But there were no guarantees that I was going to get in. Uh, second reason was my wife and I were pregnant with our first child, John Jr. I had no job. I needed to get a job, right? So military was a, a good choice as, as well, get a job. And so we came in. And on the way to the, uh, the world-class athlete program, which I did make, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm came up. Wow. And so I was diverted to the Gulf War, where I became a combat veteran, served with the 6th uh, the 27th Field Artillery out of um, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, it's called MLRS, M Multiple Launch Rocket Systems. Uh, we, mm. Steel Rain is kind of the the, the terminology of it. Uh, and when I came back, I, I, I really was not in the best shape to try to make an Olympic team in the 110 okay. meter high hurdles. <laughs> I lost my rhythm, and I, I was struggling to break, you know, 14 seconds in the high hurdles. And that, and wow. and, and I'm like, that's like almost a second behind what I needed to have, right? And I was close. I was a, when I left, I was about a half a second. So I was like 13.5, 13.4 hurdler. Uh, so I, all I needed was a couple more tenths of a second and I could be there at, at the Olympics in the, in the high hurdles. So I switched events to the 400 meter hurdles. And in my uh, fifth race ever, I qualified for the Olympic trials. And in my sixth race, I finished 17th uh, in the first round of the Olympics. So I was like, Olympic trials. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is my race. Yeah. I can do this. Uh, so I said, I'm going to sign up for another four years. Hopefully another war, a war won't come in and I can actually train for th those games. And, and I was doing that. I was on a trajectory that Ed, the great Edwin Moses said I was on the same trajectory that he was on when he yeah. first started running the race as well. And I was learning it. I was studying it. I was very disciplined to it uh, and had my first sub 40, uh, 50 second hurdle race uh, that year in 1994 when the wow. inevitable happened. Yeah. So let's let's before we jump to the inevitable, I think one of the things that I that I wanted to hit just now as well as you joined the military, a lot of people see Olympic athletes and they just kind of figure, oh, yeah, they, they, they trained, they got to the Olympics, but there's a financial component. So part of your military rationale was to give you the training room, but also to take care of yourself and financially be able to, to sustain yourself in order to make the the olympics so um i want to point that out so now you go to war. well that, that's a great point right and so mm -hmm. so that's kind of i want to pause just right there because yeah, you're, you're exactly right uh and so if you look at the military at this point it's it, the military the united states army has become my sponsor mm -hmm. they that's the way i'm looking at them they are my sponsor to go to the olympic games that's the totally the way i was thinking about it most olympic and paralympic athletes when they are training Mm -hmm. We are outspent in this country five to one wow. by developed countries on going to the game. So how do we win? How do we wow. win the medal count every single year when we're outspent five to one? Most of our athletes are working a second job. You mm -hmm. know, I know we see the Michael Phelps. We see, you know, um, the Allison Felixes and and the, the high level athletes. The um, uh, what's the, gym, the little gymnast name now? There's just about to make Gabby, the team. Um, Gabby, get, get, not Gabby Douglas. Douglas, the other one. Um, Ah oh, man, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, uh, Simone Biles is and, the other one. That I'm talking Simone Biles. About. Simone Biles. Yeah. So yeah. so those are, are are the anomalies, right? They're the yeah. ones that are kind of outside of the the threshold. They're the ones that get the sponsorships, but yeah. most athletes do not get sponsored. They don't have the dollars, so they're usually working a secondary job to to make wow. their dreams happen, to make their dreams come true. Yet we still win the medal count because wow. we, I believe, have the support network, the support systems that are there 
that outperform every other country so that when our athletes show yeah. up to the starting line, they are the most prepared at the yeah. at the starting line. So wow. that's just kind of an out an aside to the conversation saying that you can it's it's not necessarily about the dollars that you have in your pocket. Mm -hmm. It's it's how you are expending them and investing in yourself in order to get to the dreams and goals that you want and desire. Wow. Wow. So uh, wow, that's that's a lot of stuff that people most people most of us don't even know. So you you're doing that. The, the army or the military is your sponsor. Um, and you literally go to war. You go to war and you make it through the war in one piece, intact, and you come back here and you have a mishap. So take us through the experience up to the moment where the the, the misstep literally happens. Yeah, so thanks. So I was I was stationed in Presidio, San Francisco when I came back. I, that was where I was doing my my training. And when I, you mm -hmm. know, finished up in this, my second Olympic trial, 17th in the country. Um, mm -hmm. And so then I was I was I was uh, I went on to Germany to to continue my military service. And I was, you know, trying to make rank. Uh, I love the military I was on my way to officer candidate school. And I did another all army track and field camp in 1994. And on that a week before uh, the, the 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 kind of that day, I had just run my first sub 50 second 400 meter hurdle race. So I was really on the glide path, the glide scope into making the team. That's was that was my only uh, kind of mission. If I could just improve my time three to five tenths of a second every yeah. single year, I knew I would make the team uh, because it's just mathematical. It just it just worked. So uh, so that's what I was aspiring towards. And then May 17th, 1994 happened. Wow. Wow. So we're, we're going to take a commercial break here in just a second, but tell us uh, what happens on May 17th, two, uh, not 2000, uh, 1994. Wow. A little bit while ago. Yeah. A little Go while. Yeah. That, 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 that is 20, 27 years of uh, anniversary. Yeah. Um, so I'm training for the 400 meter hurdles. It's mm -hmm. very windy. I'm in Hayes, Kansas. I'm on the all army track and field team. I'm uh, about to make the, the world class athlete program again. I'm on my way to officer candidate school as well. I've been boarded in Germany. So I'm, I'm about to become a put the, the, the gold bars off for second second lieutenant. I uh, can't mm -hmm. wait to, to do that. I'm, I'm going to go through with a guy named Ben Curitan, who actually just since retired. Uh, we're going to be battle buddies through this whole process. Uh, we're planning our whole lives out because we know that if we can just do 20 more years, we can retire, right? It's going to yeah. be great. So I I, um, uh, I I come out. It's really windy and haze. And I'm approaching every hurdle in my training session. I have a race the next day. I'm approaching every hurdle at the speed of about 8.7 meters per second. 8.7 wow. meters per second, which equates to what? Uh, my math is, uh, I don't know. Something it's fast. About, it's, that's like it's, 20, it's fast. 19 miles per hour. I don't know. <laughs> 19. It's exactly right. It's very fast. So, yeah. and I'm ambidextrous. I, I can take the hurdle with either leg. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But I lead with my left, my right leg leading first down mm -hmm. the back stretch is what I like. So I'm setting that race pattern up because sometimes in hurdles, as in life, we really want all things to stay the same. So yeah. I was doing that right leg pattern down the back stretch, but the wind's blowing hard and my right leg's coming up, my left leg's coming up. My left leg comes up, my right leg's come up. And sometimes in hurdles as in life, we just want things to stay the same. So I get on the blocks, I do my one last proverbial pass, my right leg is leading over the first hurdle, that's great, I'm on. Second hurdle, right leg leads again, I'm on again. When I approach the third hurdle, I see I'm gonna be short because the wind has blown me back off my, uh, my course. But I push back against that Kansas wind that day, and I realize I'm going to have to take up my left leg. No problem. Off the right leg, I go cross over my left leg. And when I land, I hear. Oh, wow. And my body sails in the air and twists. And I see my left shin pass in front of my face. Wow. So we're going to pause my shoulders. There. That is like right in the middle of our story here. So I want to pause there. And I know some of you are a little mad at me right now because we're <laughs> right in the middle of that story. Pause. I want to take a commercial break really quickly from our sponsor. And then we're going to come back and not only hear the end of this, but how does John then pivot and make that, that transition to becoming a medalist? Let's do this. Are you a content creator, speaker, or thought leader? Do you pull your hair out every time you try to edit a video or get really disappointed when your videos don't get the views you're hoping for? It's okay to admit that you need help. If you're ready to stop wasting time and start spreading your message, it's nice to meet you. I'm Kayla O'Brien of Kayla O'Brien Media. I help creators in a variety of businesses get a foolproof game plan for their video content. 
that sound like something you want? No matter where you're starting from today, you need to know what your goals are, how to get the highest production value, and how to edit your content to fit correctly on each platform. No matter what your budget, there are options that can help you get started today. If you're ready to take your content creation experience from this to this, visit KaloBryanMedia.com and let's connect. Kayla O'Brien Media. Listen, go to KaylaO'BrienMedia.com for all of your video and content creation needs. So, John, we are literally in midair at this point. Your your left shin is is coming by you. What, what what's next? What happens next? So I hit the ground, and I bounce to a halt. Mm -hmm. And I do a quick one to my body. Okay, my shoulders okay. My waist is okay. When I see my knee, my left leg is now canted across my right leg. Mm -hmm. The foot is touching the black surface of the track. And um, the pain is about to, to hit. And in that moment, kind of between the pain and the reality of what is going on, what's just happened, I'm thinking about a lot of things that are just kind of just hitting my my brain. You know, did I can I get up? Can I, can I move? Can I walk? What's, what's going on? I'm, I'm in, I'm in that kind of that zone, that space of, of what's just happened. Mm -hmm. And then the pain hits and the, the, the witnesses out there on that day said the loudest word I said was hallelujah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. From, from there, there was a lot of things, you know, this kind of was a, it was a rush of stuff. I remember my teammates kind of singing songs and hymn with, hymns with me to keep me calm. I remember the, the EMTs coming in, not wanting to reset my leg at that point. They wanted to get me in the back of the emergency vehicle, take me to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I kind of, re I remember the doctor saying, you know, we're going to have to reduce your knee, which means, you know, pull it back in place. Uh, so I braced myself for it and, you know, they snap it in, in place. And I, I don't remember too much about all that. What I do remember is after having been medevaced to Wichita, Kansas, and after a, a few vein graft operations because my artery had been blocked. Right. So they did a they did a vein graft to take an artery from my right leg, put it into my left leg to actually make the arterial flow work. I remember my wife Alice holding on to my left hand. Um, my parents were on the opposite side of the bed and my little son junior was playing. He's five and a half years old, playing with a little toy train at the, the bottom of the bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Randy Mullins who was in his another white lab coat. He's got a thescope around his neck. He says, you, you, John, you got a tough choice to make. You wow. can, you can either keep your leg, use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, or I can amputate your leg. You can use. Wow prosthesis for the rest of your life so i thought you know what what kind of choice is that you know yeah yeah wow so so you're pondering this choice um is there anything that helps you to make the decision yeah the the the, the biggest thing was not you know looking at oh i'm gonna be a great paralympic athlete <laughs> wow it, it was not um, days will get better. It was only the pain is so great that if I just can get rid of the leg, I can get rid of the pain. Wow. That was wow. my choice. And I, and I look back at Dr. Mullen and said, I know, I know it has to be amputated. Mm. You know, it's probably going to be amputated anyway. However, at this point in time, I mean, I'm – my heart rate's over 115, 118 beats a minute. Um, it's not coming down. I'm in a just high level. Couldn't go into car. I can go into cardiac arrest. Thank goodness I was. I'm an athlete at that point, right? Yeah. So my heart rate can can withstand levels of 180 to 190 beats a minute. So 120 is really my resting rate for doing another activity, another exercise. Yeah. So um, and my my lowest rate my sleeping rate was like 45 beats a minute to 48 beats a minute mm -hmm. so the heart was a, the heart was strong i knew it could you could get through it but you know it's an extended period of time it's it's not like recover and, and stop it was recover and 
stay at 120, 115, 120 beats a minute. Wow. So I think the wow. doctor was worried about I was going to go into cardiac arrest. Wow. Because the, so, it was just so high. Yeah. So, so I mean, this is obviously a, a really emotional time and, and we can kind of step through all of the days here, but, but for the sake of, of time here. So we, we, you make the decision, you end up getting a prosthesis. What then starts to happen in your mind? What brings you to the point where you're like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to use my athletic prowess and go to the Paralympics. What, what happened? Yeah, I, it's, 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 it, this is the crust of like what I talk about, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's so important to recognize that we don't just jump into the next thing. Right. We make these small decisions um, to win. And I, what I call it's like the jump is the jump or yeah. the fears I was having that my wife might leave me or my son might not see me as his dad wow. anymore. All those fears I had were really not my fears of that. It was my identity. Mm -hmm. Like, who am I now? Is, is, am I still desirable? Wow. Am I still, am I still worthy to be around people? Do people still like me? And if they don't, what does that mean? And I think that's where we get into the fears. We don't articulate those fears. And when our when our when our truth outweighs our fear, we'll commit to a courageous life. We'll commit to a courageous act. Wow. And it was my wife that really said, uh, she said to me, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. This really just is our new normal. Mm -hmm. And when she spoke those words, that baseline my entire existence. And I was able from that point to actually begin to elevate. So using my faith and faith in God, faith in Christ to my wife to my help meet my support system that was that is here to my son not you know flipping really fast right he jumped off a swing set on the playground and he's, he's he says hey dad you see my big jump mom dad you see my big jump so i realized in that moment he's already flipped his mindset to a uh, a new normal mind sight is what i say now mm. mindset is where we are mind sight is where we desire to be wow and so that jump is your jump only you can make the jump and that was the 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 beginnings of it. When I made that jump, it was not to the Paralympic Games. It was let me stand up on my good leg for fifteen seconds. Wow. Let me stand up on my good leg for for one minute. Let me manipulate a wheelchair to get to my prosthetic appointments. Let me learn how to put on an artificial leg. Let me walk between the parallel bars. Let me go from the parallel bars to a four bar walker, from the walker to crutches, crutches to a cane, cane to free walking, free walking to swimming, swimming to running, running to jumping, jumping to a silver medal. Mm. The process took six years, yeah. but we want it right now. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. And so we have to be willing to commit to the process after we commit to the jump that we need to make in our life. Wow. And that's, that is so powerful, man. It's, it's not only that we want things now. I think there is some level of people that, that we're kind of looking at others. They're looking at the John registers. They're looking at the Kardashians. They're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, whoever else is the latest Instagram influencer. And they're saying, okay, they had a silver spoon in their mouth or they did this and then something happened and they were able to immediately jump into that next thing. Uh, so tell us a, a little bit more. I mean, you, you, you've talked about your faith, you've talked about your family um, and you've talked about the physical therapy and the process that, that you had to go through. But you were initially before that you were also doing military stuff to as a support system, financial support system. For, for your for your family and for your career as well. And that stuff is gone now. So what do you then begin to focus on in order to help with the financial part of things? So, right. So now I don't know if I can stay in the military or, or not. And I, I, I wind up getting out of the military and I want and I start working for the Army's world class athlete program. The program, the very program I was once an athlete in, I'm now a sports specialist helping the other people that are still in the program to try to accomplish their dreams. At the parallel time, I'm swimming for physical therapy, and I get so fast in the water that I make the 1996 Paralympic swim team. Wow. <laughs> and wow. I go to Atlanta as a swimmer yeah. when I'm supposed to go as a 400-meter hurdler. Man. And it was it was powerful because, you know, you talk about the friendships that are around you. When I went to the Olympic trials, the trials I'm supposed to make the team at, 
I'm watching the 400 meter hurdles. I'm about to go up in the stands and all the 400 meter hurdlers that knew me when I was running, they asked me to come sit with them. Those that did not, did not, did not make the finals to mm-hmm. watch the entire race. So they say, Hey John, come up sit with us. Right. So it was like, you belong here. We still got mm-hmm. you. It was, I'm part of the community. So that was, it was huge for me. Yeah. Right. Cause like, I, do I belong? That is the, that was a huge question. I think we always have that belonging question. And then I saw athletes running and jumping with artificial limbs when I went to the the Paralympic Games in in, uh, Atlanta. And I said, I got to get one of those things made. And then four years from then, you know, that's when I go to Sydney, Australia, qualify for the 100 meters, the 200 meters. uh, And I wound up I wind up winning silver in the long jump, setting the American record in the process. Uh, All the while working the world class athlete program, all the while having this new job and supporting uh, the family and beginning this the, the 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 beginnings of Inspired Communications International, which is my uh, inspirational professional speaking company, uh, where we help business professionals hurdle their adversities, amputate their fear, embrace yeah. a new normal mindset in order to win the medals that are in their lives. And so yeah. that's that's what we do now, right? Because the story is so uh, visceral that. We can say, can you make your own jump? Because mm-hmm. I, I can, I can lead you. You can lead a person. You got a great podcast. You know, you can, you can share these amazing stories with people. But at the end of the day, they got to make, they got to choose to make the jump. They got to jump. We can't do it for them. They've got to jump. You, there, there's two words. There are two words that you've said quite a few times uh, mm-hmm. during this. You, you've said new normal, yeah. and over the past eighteen months or so. Our world, our, and, and I, I can only talk about the United States in particular, we've yep. been hearing this terminology, new normal. And for a lot of us, it's been this chaotic, uh, not knowing what to expect thing. And, and we're like new normal. But you're, you're talking about new normal from 27 years ago, right? You, you yeah, had absolutely. To make, so h- how, did, how did that transition or the ability to make that new normal transition help you and help you help others over the past year. Yeah, that's that's a great question because I think we use it so many t- so much times now is mm-hmm. it becomes over an overused phrase. Yeah. But let's let's unpack it, right? Because most people are using it in one of two ways, Robert. Well, the first way they're using it is is a past statement, right? Yeah. Um or a past place that we want to be. And they'll say it like this, "Well, I can't I can't wait till things get back to normal." Mm, that's yeah. that's one way we're saying it, right? The second way we're saying it is a point of destination. Well, I guess this is just our new normal. Yeah. And so both of those two phrases, okay, well, but I take issue with them. I'm not issue, I, I challenge them. Because when we really break the word down new and normal, new means no prior point of reference. And yeah. what happened with COVID was we had a new we had a new point of reference, but we were trying to use old things to to uh to accentuate where we actually were you know as, as a biblical reference you know pour, pouring old wine into new wineskins yep <laughs> it bursts it bursts you can't do it so you yeah. got to have a new thought a new process of 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 pushing yourself forward and we were unwilling to do that and what it came out was what came out was panic yeah we panicked we bought toilet paper we bought hand sanitizer <laughs> we hoarded water it came out as panic <laughs> yeah and then, you know, and, and we're panicking again, right? We're, you just had a person on the airline punching somebody in the mouth. Wear your mask, put the tray table up, bam, no, you know? So we're seeing this happen again because we have taken our oxygen out of our environment. Normal then is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. Mm-hmm. So what are, we, what, the, what are the rituals we have in place that lead to a rhythm that elevate us to a rise that create a result in our lives? We can still have these rituals that are going on to to push us forward. The new normal, therefore, is not a destination at all. It's like the Olympic motto of Sidious Altius Fortius. The Latin words, when translated in English, mean swifter, higher, stronger. Mm -hmm. The Olympic motto is not swiftest, highest, or strongest, which is the superlative of the word, but it has an ER stim ending that we can be the swiftest today, swifter tomorrow. Jump the highest today, jump higher tomorrow. Lift the heaviest Mm -hmm. weight today. Lift heavier weight tomorrow. If you're in sales out there, you have the best sales today. You have better sales tomorrow. So the new normal never is a destination. It's only a plateau by which we grow. And that's how I use it. 
that I'm always thinking about, okay, how's the new? What's the new environment I'm in right now? How do I put oxygen back into my environment? And then once I can put my own oxygen mask on, who else do I need to help? Who else can I support? Who else can I uh, bring life to and put their oxygen mask on so they can make the jumps that are, that are necessary for their lives? Wow, John, that is, man, fantastic. I think just that last four-minute segment was a masterclass by itself in, as you say, mind sight, not just mindset, but mind sight. Where are you looking? Where, what, what, what are you putting into your mind that allows you to really grab that situation or that that what's the word that I'm looking for, that that ideal future, or maybe it's not even ideal, it's just better than it was today. How can you grow from today? Not right. being satisfied with where you are right now, not being complacent, but always looking towards growth. So man, tell right. us a little bit, and we'll end with this. What what are you up to? Where can people find you? How, how do you work with and help people and organizations? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, uh, I have a website, which is johnregister.com, J-O-H-N, register like cash register, dot com. You can find all my social media platforms on there in the upper right hand corner. Uh, I have a there's a, a new demo reel that's out there. So if you are looking to to book a, an, an inspirational speaker to collaborate with you, you can find me there uh, as as well. We do have a Facebook group, which is called uh, Amputate Fear. Dot, uh, dot com. I think it's, you can get it through amputatefear.com, but it's www.facebook.com slash groups with an S slash amputate fear. And in there, we we have these some of these more conversations and I'll go live and it will have some, um, you know, we'll, 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 we push, push some content. So we do a little bit in there. That's, that's kind of the fastest way to get connected with me. So thanks again for that, Robert. Wow. Amazing. Fabulous. Listen, I don't know if you have been able to amputate fear in this segment. If not, I want to ask you to rewind this, replay this. Let us know that you've watched it by sharing it on social media and then tagging John Register or tagging myself so that we can know that you've been transformed and inspired by this segment today. I don't know about you. I've been inspired. I'm not going to be satisfied. I'm not going to roll into tomorrow the same as I was today. My goal is growth. My goal is upward. My goal is onward. And with all of that, my goal is to inspire somebody else. So, hey, everything that happens to you in life is your stuff. Your stuff is your story and your story deserves a stage. What's your story?